we begin today a five-week series on uh, heaven. As I was praying about what to preach and uh, leading up to this, knowing we would be through with our previous series, one of the ways that God, I think, led me to this is as I read social media, which I'm seriously considering giving up, but uh, as I read social media and um, as I listen to Christians all over talk about it, first of all, I hear a lot of confusion about heaven. I hear a lot of, I think, bad theology about heaven that we've just kind of adopted over the years. And um, as I read scripture, I see such a tremendous truth about heaven that when we think about heaven, we think about all that God has taught us about heaven and and the real truth about heaven, what a glorious inspiration it is for this life that we live now, but also what an encouragement it is to know that this life is not all there is. There's life beyond this. And so... As we look through these things, we're just, today, honestly, is going to be kind of an introductory. Uh, we're going to, it's like we're going to fly a drone over the Scripture today and, and kind of look at uh, a lot of things that Scripture says about heaven. And then we're going to zoom that drone in over the next few weeks over certain parts of what we hear today. We're going to kind of take what we talk about today and go a little deeper into various parts of it. But what I hope that we accomplish is, first of all, I hope we come to a good biblical understanding about heaven. And all that, it, all that it is and all that's there and all that God has prepared for us and, and the glory that it is. Uh, but then I also hope that it will become an encouragement for you in the life that you'll... I hope every Monday after you've been here on Sunday, you'll wake up and think, wow, in light of what I heard yesterday, I think, I think maybe I can face this Monday. I think maybe I can face this week. And so that's what I'm kind of praying that God will do for us over the course of of these uh, next few weeks. Also, I think any, I think in order to have perspective on any discussion about heaven, we have to kind of keep in mind the overall story arc of the Bible, the whole story of redemption itself. I know you hear me repeat this a lot, but I repeat it a lot because we forget a lot. And this is the one thing I don't want us to forget. God's plan for history really the whole story of what God has done, is doing, and will do, wrapped up in four parts. And that is, first of all, that God created a perfect world. Placed Adam and Eve in a perfect garden and had special fellowship with them, unlike anything anyone else has ever known since. Made great and precious promises to them about the life that they would have, gave them meaning and purpose, and, and promised that with that meaning and purpose, he would enable them to fulfill all of that. And then along came the serpent, who fed them a lie that God could not be trusted and God could not be believed, that there was so much more out there than God was letting on. And if they would listen to him and do what he said, then their life would be so much better. And Adam and Eve sinned. They fell. That sin has been passed on to every one of us. We are sinners both by nature, but it's not that we just can't help it. We, are, we know we're sinners. We know what's right. We know what's wrong. And we choose to sin. We choose to disobey God. We are fallen. The sin of Adam and Eve corrupted all of mankind. So that we are not able, even the good that we do is just a residual image of God inside of us. But our heart is incredibly selfish and will do what it wants to do. But God, knowing that, even as he expelled Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, made a promise of redemption. While most of the rest of the Bible is a story of man trying to get himself back right with God, it is also the story of God lining things up for that perfect time when he would bring his son into the world to be our redeemer, to, to pay for sin and to set back and reverse the curse that sin had made. We see that coming to a climax in the New Testament and the Gospels as Jesus, the perfect Son of God, came to live the life that we should have lived but couldn't and died the death that we should have died so that we wouldn't. 
and we see him rise again to give us life. That all who would believe and trust in him and surrender to him as Savior and Lord would be redeemed, their sin would be paid for, and they would begin a journey of the fourth uh, level of God's work, and that is the level of restoration. That day by day, God is changing us into the image of Christ, making us more like Christ through his Holy Spirit, through his word. As we surrender to him, he changes our heart that we could not change itself. And then this great plan of restoration is seen in its climax in the last of the Bible as God restores this earth to the original plan that he had for it. He makes a new earth for us to populate with this new heart and this new life. Sin is done away with. The evil is completely vanquished forever. And we are brought back into this perfect, perfect fellowship with God. And so when we see heaven in its proper place in this story, we see it as both a place now for those who have been redeemed for their souls to go as well as a place for us to look forward to for all of eternity. The main point that I want us to get out of what we look at today is that God resides in a place called heaven where he gathers together all the souls of those who have been redeemed through his son Jesus. I don't have an insert of notes for you. I don't have a flashy PowerPoint for you today. I do have notes online. You'll see in the back of your bulletin a couple of ways you can access that. It's a QR code. If you've got your phone, you want to follow along now, you can... Uh, you can click on that QR code and it'll call up the notes. Or if you want to wait you get home, go on your computer. There's the web address there. You can type that in and it'll, it'll go to the website that has a link to the notes that are on it as well. And so we're going to look at a lot of verses and we're going to look at a lot of things. We're going to start with this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 uh, that Joe read for us earlier. And we're going to consider this idea of heaven. Now, as we think about heaven... There are two words primarily in the Bible that are translated heaven. In the Old Testament, it is the word shemayim. That is a plural word in Hebrew, and most of the time heaven is thought of in its plural term. A lot of times you see it translated that way, the heavens. And in the New Testament, it is the word uranos. Same way. You'll see it a lot of times in its plural form, or you may see it in its singular form. Now, I want us to go back to the scripture that we began with today uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, because it's a very interesting story that Paul tells. Uh, Paul does not claim that this happened to him, although this is philosophical language of Paul's day. Now, remember that Paul was educated was very highly educated. He was educated in one of the most, by one of the most prominent rabbis known in his time. And so he would have been very familiar with this type of discourse. He would have been very familiar with using this kind of language in a public arena. And so he is kind of speaking from the third person. He is talking about a man in Christ 14 years prior. Now, uh, from the time that the book of 2 Corinthians was written, if you look about 14 years prior to that, Paul had indeed been converted. Uh, it would have been sometime in the early 40s A.D. He had been converted, and uh, it was early in his Christian walk, his walk with Jesus. And so it quite possibly was Paul. Uh, just Paul not wanting to draw attention to himself so that he wouldn't be boasting in himself as he's making the point with this passage. But he said he, he knew a man in Christ, so it's a believer, it's a brother, it's a man in Christ, who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. And he uses that phrase, third heaven. And that's kind of the basis for the title of the message today, How Many Heavens Are There? And I'm not counting heavens to Betsy, and I'm not counting heavens to Murgatroyd, Okay. Uh, those are if you know Heavens to Murgatroyd, you're like my age or older. Um, if you know Heavens to Betsy, you're probably my age or older as well. But in the Bible, how many ways are heaven, the word heaven, how is it mentioned? There are basically three. Uh, first of all, when the Bible speaks of heaven, the first heaven, and, and philosophy and science of that day kind of viewed it this way, the first heaven is what we would call our atmosphere. It's where the birds fly. It's where the planes fly. 
Uh, you know, it's, it's where, you know, the air that we breathe resides. That's first heaven. Second heaven is what we would call, in our day, outer space. It's beyond our atmosphere. It's just beyond the gravitational pull of the earth. It's out there, and it goes as far as where the sun is, where the stars are. It's where those, um, uh, those uh, we see all the satellites that go over. It's where the International Space Station flies over. Uh, it's where we see the Starlink train when it goes over. Uh, and it goes as far out as the stars that we see and the planets that we see. Uh, our moon is in this, what would be called the second heaven. Uh, the Hubble spacecraft is somewhere way out there in the far reaches of the second heaven. And really, there is in our comprehension no limit to this second heaven. We don't know how far this second heaven goes because God has created such a glorious universe outside of this earth's atmosphere that we can't even fathom where the end of it will be. So that's the second heaven, what we call outer space. First heaven is atmosphere, second heaven is space. The third heaven is the place where God is. And we'll look in just a moment, we'll, we'll kind of, when we kind of conclude, come to our conclusion, we'll see this, but I want us to understand that heaven is a, it is a place. And we can't say with certainty just from Scripture if it is a, if it is a, only a spiritual place or if it has any kind of physical dimension to it, but it is a literal place. There is a place called heaven, and that is the place where God is. That is this third heaven. And so what we're going to do over the next few weeks, for the next four weeks after today, I promise you we're not going to talk about first heaven or second heaven. We're not going to deal with the atmosphere. We're going to let the weather people do that. We're not going to deal with outer space. We're going to let the space cadets do that. Uh, we're going to talk about this third heaven. What does the Bible say about this third layer of heaven, this place where God is and where God has gathered together the souls of those who have been redeemed, who are believers in him, and they reside with him today, and where we'll go when we die and what will happen uh, even into eternity. That's what we're going to look at. Now, this idea of visions of this third heaven, this is not the only time in Scripture this is mentioned. There are at least, I can think of, three other cases where this happened. Uh, the first of those is in Isaiah chapter 6, the verses that Robert read for us earlier today, where Isaiah, in a vision in the year that King Uzziah died, saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and lifted up. And so wherever this third heaven is, and in whatever dimension this third heaven exists, Isaiah saw it. And he describes all through that chapter the things that he saw. And then in Revelation chapter 4, uh, in verse 1, as John is writing the book of Revelation, he said, After this I looked, and behold, there was an open door standing in front of me into heaven. And the first voice that I heard said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. So he was invited to see this place that is called heaven. The third place that I, I, I can remember this being a case is in the book of Acts when Stephen was stoned. The Bible says that he looked up into heaven and he saw the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father. There's some theological significance in that because we know that in Scripture... Jesus went to be seated at the right hand of the Father. But at the time he was giving his life as a martyr for the cause of Christ, Christ stood to greet him into his presence. So there's at least three times in Scripture that we, we see that someone had at least some sort of, of um, eye view of this third heaven that we are going to talk about over these next several weeks. So what I want us to do today... Is I just, as I said, I want us to kind of get a, a bird's eye view of all of this. And I want us to think of today heaven in two terms. I want us to understand what heaven is now and what heaven will be then. Because there are some differences in Scripture. And sometimes we get those two things confused. We get some of the things that are in Scripture described as things that will happen in the future as though they exist in heaven now. 
And while heaven now is a great place, it's not yet even what uh, God is preparing for us. So what is heaven like today, and what will heaven be like in the future? First of all, as we look at what will heaven be like today, we have to understand what we call the realm of the dead. When the Bible speaks of the realm of the dead, generally it uses one, in the Old Testament it uses the word Sheol, and in the New Testament uses the word Hades, or in a couple occasions in the gospel, in the gospels, and in one other place uh, in the book of James, it uses the term Gehenna. Now, while those are also general terms for the abode of the dead, they more specifically speak of the landing place of those who were not followers of God, those who were not believers in Jesus Christ, those who were not born again. And we hear some pretty uh, horrible descriptions of, the, of those places, that it's a place of darkness, that it is a place of torment. And we're going to look at this more in detail next week, so I won't go in, into too much detail into it today, but in Luke chapter 16, when Jesus told the story of the rich man and Lazarus, he gave a very descriptive place of what Hades looked like. Now Jesus referred to this place as Gehenna where the unbelievers would go, a place of punishment. Uh, that term Gehenna is actually kind of Anglicized Hebrew, and it means the Valley of Hinnom. The Hinnom Valley outside of Jerusalem was a horrible, horrible place. Uh, it, in the, con in the times of Joshua, was the boundary between Judah and Benjamin. So it's, it's right there, you know, kind of on the line uh, between those two. But we find it coming to just the, the horrible story about the Valley of Hinnom. And it literally was called the, the Valley of the Son of Hinnom in the time of Ahab. In the time of Ahab, because of his wife Jezebel, who led him to false gods, they worshipped the false god Moloch. The false god Moloch demanded that children be sacrificed alive. And the Hinnom Valley was the place that Ahab set up this altar to Molech where children were sacrificed. This is the kind of place this was. Now, it was some years later uh, in the realm, reign, reign I think, of uh, Joash, where Joash brought Israel back to following God. And he went in and he, he I like the double negative, he defiled this false altar. <laughs> In other words, he set it back right. He tore it down where that kind of false worship could no longer take place. Well, over the years, the Hinnom Valley kind of became, what's a good way to describe this, kind of became the, the, um, the landfill. It was the place where the sewage ran. Uh, it was the place where all the animals who were sacrificed in the temple the carcasses, the parts they couldn't use for the sac the parts that were not even usable for sacrifice were taken there. Any kind of dead animal, uh, if you were to slay an animal to eat, uh, the parts you couldn't eat, the carcasses, everything went there. It was a filthy, disgusting place. And there was a constant fire burning just because of the collection of combustible gases from the, and this is just great before lunch, isn't it? From, the, from the, the, the decaying, rotting stuff, organic matter that was there, all right? Ugly, ugly place. Jesus said those who would not believe would be cast into a place like this, where there would be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, where there was a fire that was never quenched, and where there were worms. You might picture what you might see in a decomposing situation like that, that would never, never stop. But he contrasts that with a place he called paradise. Uh, in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, he said that Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom, which is another term for that same place. We hear of par the paradise of God in the Old Testament. In fact, Eden is referred to as a paradise of God. 
And we find that not only was Lazarus, the rich man, taken there, but Jesus told the thief on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise. So today, when a believer in Jesus dies, we place their body into a grave to await the final resurrection and their soul in, in some form that the Bible never fully explains for us, but uh, in some way their soul is, is disembodied but still has a very life-like existence in this place called paradise. How do I know that it's a lifelike existence? Well, we'll look into this some more next week, but in that parable of Abraham, of Lazarus and the rich man, the rich man looks up and can see paradise and recognizes Lazarus. It was a very recognizable figure that was there. So, uh, now, one of the things that we, and I'll just kind of stop here and correct, I'll get into this a little more next week, but we, we think a lot of times about, well, you know what, they have a new body now. You know, a person who dies right now doesn't have a new body. They, they really don't have a body at all. But we are promised that one day when Jesus returns, the graves will open up and that decaying, rotting body will be made perfect and be reunited with that soul and then we'll have that perfect body. That's what the Bible teaches about the body. But now granted... In paradise, you don't have that broken down body either. You don't have that cancer. You don't have that sore back. You don't have, you know, you don't have those aches and pains. All of that's done away with. You are free, and, and you are awaiting the resurrection, that final resurrection when your body will be perfect, perfected and you'll be reunited with that scripture. We'll look at all of this in detail down the road. Look at the scriptures that point to these. But understand that today... When a believer, this is what I want to make sure we understand, when a believer in Jesus Christ dies, immediately as they take their last breath of earth's air, they take their first breath in paradise in the presence of God. They are in his presence in this place that Jesus called paradise. It is a place in his presence, apart from sin, apart from suffering. It is a place of glory. It is a place of bliss. But it is a place that is meant to be temporary. To hold those souls until the time their bodies are resurrected and, and, and God has consummated this restoration project on the new earth that he has for us. That's heaven today. Well, dig, stay with me. We're going to dig into that in much greater detail next week. What about heaven in the future? Well, we understand from the book of Revelation that those who are in Hades, Gehenna, in torment, who were not believers, will be brought up and judged and then cast into what is called the eternal lake of fire, where they will suffer incredible torment for all of eternity. But we also understand there's a place for believers. The book of Revelation tells us that God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And this new heaven, he said, it's like a new Jerusalem coming down. And it's going to be the place where, God, where, where God's presence is. But I, I want you to understand this. Okay, I, I, I want to say this, and don't turn me off as soon as I say it, because you're going to miss the explanation, and you're going to go out here saying, I said something I didn't say. We will not live forever in heaven with God. I'm let that sink in for a moment. Okay, preacher, what are we going to do then? God is creating a new earth for us. We're told we'll populate the earth. And this earth, the way it was meant to be when it was first created, is going to be remade in its perfection. God didn't create Adam and Eve to dwell in some kind of, you know, cloud place with him. God created an earth for Adam and Eve, and he told them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. God's original plan was for earth to be perfect, the perfect habitation for those that he had created, for those who would be his. And that's what God is doing. He's circling back to the way the story ought to be. And so God is creating this glorious earth for us. Now his presence will be with us in this new Jerusalem, in this new heaven. And do I believe we'll be able to go there? Yes. But what I like in the end of the book of Revelations, it says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. Now, I'll get real happy about this in a couple of weeks when we preach on this, but I, I got I to gotta take a bite out of the sandwich now because it's that good. In the Old Testament, 
presence of God was always behind a curtain, behind a door. Man could not get to it. Now, the presence of God is with man. See, I get goosebumps thinking about that. God is not walling himself. You know why? Because sin has been done away with. Abraham, excuse me, Adam and Eve enjoyed the presence of God until they sinned. We, we can only know the presence of God through His Holy Spirit indwelling us. But then, because sin will be done away with, we will be fully cleansed. We will be in our resurrected bodies. Sin will be no more. The presence of God will be ours. We'll be able to know Him in real presence. Now we'll, we'll dig into that one in a couple of weeks. I almost want to preach it first, but we've got to do it in chronological order. It won't make sense. So, that's kind of the look of now and then. So what, 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 do, what do we need to know about heaven to get us started? Three things we need to know about heaven. First of all, heaven is a real place. In John chapter 14, and verse 2, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If heaven were not a place, then there would be no place for us. So heaven is real. It is a real place. All right, we need to understand, as I said, we... We really can't tell from Scripture if it is in the unseen realm. It may be out there in that second heaven somewhere. It may be in the first heaven. We're just not able to see it because it is in the spiritual dimension. But whether it is spiritual or, and or physical, it is a real place. There is a place called heaven. God is there now along with the souls of those who are redeemed, the souls of those who are his. It is a real place. The second thing for us to understand is this. Heaven is an eternal place. The concept of heaven, whether it be in, the, in paradise now or in this repopulated earth, and we're going to include that in what we call heaven because it is this concept of heaven. It is eternal. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the, Paul was writing to a group of people who... It hadn't been that long since Jesus had left. And it said, I'm coming back. And some of their relatives had died and Jesus hadn't come back. And they were a little worried about that. Okay, well, what happened? They're, they're, they're gone. Are we ever going to see them again? And Paul began to tell about how things would take place. In the end of this description, he said, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with a voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's our bodies. That's the, 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 the bodies that we're waiting for. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. But get this. And so we will always be with the Lord. Heaven is an eternal place. There's a flip side to that. Because not only is heaven an eternal place for those who are believers in Jesus, but hell is also an eternal place for those who don't believe. Eternity is forever, and eternity is locked in. But a third thing we, I think we, we need to know about heaven moving forward is this. Heaven is an exclusive place. You may live in a neighborhood now that maybe is a gated community and you've got to have a transponder or a card or something to get through a gate. Or maybe you live in a neighborhood that has a homeowner's association and you're expected to go by certain rules and regulations that the, all the people in the neighborhood have established. You, you may think that there are exclusive places where you live now. But heaven is a much more exclusive place. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13, Enter 
in by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. But the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And there are few of those who find it. Heaven is not going to be as crowded maybe as we think it is. Heaven is not going to be a place where just everybody goes. It's an exclusive place. How do we know? Jesus said later in that same chapter in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father is in, who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do all these mighty works in your name? And Jesus will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. There wasn't a relationship. You did all these things. You claimed my name when you did them. But you never knew me. You didn't have this relationship with me. Only those who have a relationship with God through his son, Jesus, who made that possible on his, by his death and resurrection for us, who in faith have turned to him and trusted in him, are those who will enter in to this eternal reward, enter into heaven. So we need to know heaven is an exclusive place. So I want to leave you I've given you just kind of like a, today's been kind of like a shotgun. I mean, pew, 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 we've just thrown out shot in a bunch of different directions. So I want you to take all this information and I want you to funnel it, at least for our purposes today, into three applications. First of all, first of all we need to long for heaven. We need to long for heaven. If you then have been raised with Christ, I'm talking about the resurrection of Jesus. Since you share, since his resurrection has given you life, because he is alive, you are alive through your faith in him, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are the earth. Set your affection for, seek, you get the terminology, long for heaven. Secondly, live for heaven. In Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, verses 19 through 21, Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but instead lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys nor thieves can break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, I think one of the things that cause us the most stress as believers is that we put too much stock in this side of eternity. We worry too much about what happens on this side of eternity. If elections don't go our way, oh no, what are we going to do? I was just thinking this week, about the song we used to sing. There's something about that name. There's a line, kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something about that name. You know what a president is good for when he's dead? Putting his picture on a dollar bill. That's about it. But Jesus will always be. Don't live for earth. Don't get so tangled up in the now that we lose our hope because of what is awaiting us. Long for heaven, live for heaven, and then finally look for heaven. In Luke chapter 21, verse 28, Jesus was talking about what would be the sign of his coming. And he said, now when all of these things begin to take place, I like, what he, I like, I like the ESV translation, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. In other words, don't look down. Don't look around. Look up. I saw uh, this saying the other day. I like it. It said, I've stopped looking for the signs and I've started listening for the trumpet. That's a pretty good way to live. That gives us, though, a sense of urgency. What if it were today? We're almost done with this sermon, but what if it was before this sermon was over? What if it was before you got to lunch? or got on to your afternoon activities.
Are we looking for it? Are we living in light of the fact, and that's going to be the last sermon in the series, how do we live in light of heaven? What kind of urgency does it give us for our lives, personally and for those around us? Long for heaven. Live for heaven. Look for heaven. Heaven is real. I didn't need a book from a guy who says he went there for 90 seconds or however to tell me that heaven was real. This book tells me heaven is real. It's good enough for me. It's all I need to believe it. Heaven is real. It's a real place. It's an eternal place. It's an exclusive place. Can you say today that you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that when you die, that's the place you will go? You see, you can know that for sure. It's not something you have to hope for. It's not something you have to, well, I guess we'll wait and see, won't we? Jesus didn't die and, raise, and rise again so that you could wait and see. He died and rose again so that you could have life and have it abundantly. Today, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, if you'll call out to him and you'll admit to him that you're a sinner and you can't do this on your own, and that you recognize he died on the cross that because you can't, and you embrace his sacrifice for you, and you embrace his resurrection to give you life, and you surrender to him as Lord. If you will tell him that, if you will believe that, if you will trust in that truth, that is the gospel that, that saves. He will redeem you and begin this restoration project in you. And you will have a place in the final restoration when it's all said and done. You don't have to hope so when you can know so. And so I challenge you today, if you don't know about your relationship with Jesus, will you talk to me about it, talk to somebody about it, talk to God about it. Just say, today, Lord, I, wanna, I, I believe in what Jesus did, and I, I trust that, and I, I bank my life on that, and I surrender to him as my Lord. If you have done that, will you at least consider living life in view of what's to come? One of the greatest missionaries ever was a man by the name of John Studd. He was a missionary in India. He is known for this one saying above everything else. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. When we live in light of heaven, we know it's coming. We live our life in light of that. Would you bow with me as we pray?